Oh, my goodness. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. What a pleasure to gather together. And I'm very thankful for those of you who are joining us online today. And we're praying that God would visit you in your house. But, oh, my goodness, if you haven't gathered again yet in this house, then i got to invite you. Something's happening here. Something's stirring here. And we don't want you to miss out on any of it. There's goodness and gladness in the room, and so we're praying that it would just blanket everybody gathered today. In fact, I'd like for you right now, don't bow your head, don't close your eyes, but would you just ask God to bless the people behind you, to bless the people in front of you, to bless the people to your left, to bless the people to your right, just to blanket this house and every person in it, every home in it, with the gladness that was intended for those who gather. Jesus said, when you gather, in my name, I'm in your midst. And we have sensed him, we welcome him, and we invite your blessing, Lord, to this place. Would you say amen? Amen. 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 If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for accepting the invitation. That could be a very brave thing to do. You know, if this is your first time here, you don't know what we're like, you don't know what the place is like, and yet here you are. So thank you so much for coming, and whoever invited you, God bless you for caring about a friend, a family member, for somebody else to invite the blessing of God to find them today. And I hope that you'll be praying for me as well as I seek to, uh, to share my learnings in a way that could help all of us take a step to higher ground. Our question today is, what will heaven be like? Oh my goodness. You know, a few months ago we asked people what subjects they'd like for us to address. And this series, Asking for a Friend, came from that list. And we've dealt with some very challenging issues along the way. And I got to tell you about the one at hand, there's no way to cover every question rising from today's topic in a single message, okay? But Jesus has given us much to consider, and so we're going to try to cover the waterfront. When he was in the upper room, those short, short hours before he died, sharing special moments before his death with those closest to him, it was in the upper room that he first he washes the disciples' feet. It was in the upper room that he is sharing Passover and initiates communion, the new covenant with, uh, in his blood. It was in the upper room that he tells his, those that were working with him, he says, you know what, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. You're my friends. I'm calling you friends. It was in the upper room that that happened, and it was in the upper room that Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I'm coming again, and I'm going to take you to be with me so that you can be with me in that place, in my Father's house. Jesus believed that heaven is real, that heaven is a place made with you in mind. 25 of the 27 books of the New Testament mention heaven. 638 references in the New Testament to heaven. I mean, heaven is on their mind. It's the fulfillment of the blessed hope that was promised, uh, the fulfillment of the eternal life that has begun by his spirit and will one day be brought into full consummation on the other side. Every New Testament writer affirms the reality of heaven after this life. The revelation, the vision John had on the Isle of Patmos Chapter 21 begins with this amazing vision. In fact, I would like for you to stand with me as I read some of that portion of Scripture. And if you're at home, wherever you are, let's stand together to give our attention and our imagination to the Word of God. I saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Verse 3, look, God's home is now with his people. And he will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. All these things are gone forever. Would you say forever? Forever. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. 
And then the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it flowed down the center street, the center of the main street. And on each side of that river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops with fruit fresh each month. And the leaves from those trees were used for medicine to heal the nations. May God's blessing be added to his word and to his people. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I mean, what's heaven going to be like? It's going to be like a whole new world. New is the key word. Heaven is described as a new creation full of new realities that are going to be very familiar, though they're going to be brand spanking new. New bodies, new names. We're going to be singing new songs. We're going to be living in a new city. We're going to be experiencing new communities surrounded by a new garden that is just lush and teeming with life, blossoming with new life. There's going to be a new government with true liberty and justice for all. Can you believe that? It's hard to imagine, but it's, yes, paradise that was lost is now regained, and it's not just the old world all patched up. It's going to be new in kind not just new in time. You know, there's those things that are next, 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 chronology. This is new in kind. It will be familiar, but of a different kind, new. John's vision, Revelation 21 and 22, gives us three images to wrap our thoughts around. He says, heaven is like a new city, heaven is like a new garden, and heaven is like being with God in a brand new home. You ever moved into a new home? going to happen for you here. Jesus said, this place is a place that I'm preparing for you. In other words, you're going to feel right at home in that place. It's like, this is like your place. Yes, that's your room. Yes, that's your place at the table. You know, this is your home. I was thinking of you when I put this all together. What does it take to make you feel at home? Well, don't be surprised when it shows up on the other side. I mean, is it the smell of fresh baked bread or a little cafecito? <laughs> or is it like the joy of a puppy? Then don't be surprised when it shows up in your new home. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I got you in mind. And then he tells us that there's no sin allowed in that place. So we learn early on that the tragedy that soiled and spoiled human culture and human creation in this life brought death into our experience is now gone forever. Would you say forever? forever. Gone forever. We can't even imagine that because our lives are so laced through with this stuff. But when we see the vision of the eternal heaven, we see first this city. The city has a wall that's broad, it's tall. Of course, we believe we're speaking in symbols here too, though who's gonna be disappointed if this is how it turns out? Could be literally true, but what does it mean figuratively? It means that heaven is a place of security and protection. It's like being completely safe and sound. The entire city is surrounded by this impregnable defense. There's no cause for fear. Revelation 22, 15. Think about that for a moment, just for a moment. Nothing to fear, not loss, not death, not crime, not anything, not disease, not grief, no cause for fear. 22, verse 15 says this, no thieves, no thieves, no murderers, no crime, nothing impure is allowed in. Now that's a little discomforting, thinking knowing me the way I know me, you know, how am I going to get in? Because nothing impure is allowed in. Jesus said it's so safe and so sound that you can lay up all of your treasures in heaven and they will never be vulnerable to theft, rust, decay, or loss. It is totally safe and sound. Your investments are eternally secure. It's a place of security, but it's also a place of productivity. 
You know, sometimes we see cartoons of heaven with people sitting around floating on clouds and plucking harps. And, and, but we also understand those are symbols. They take our mind into a place. What does the symbol mean of being dressed in white in heaven? Well, it refers to us being dressed in the perfect righteousness of Christ, which now explains how I can get in. It's not my righteousness that gets me in. But I am going to be clothed for the occasion because I am dressed in Jesus Christ's righteousness. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, it's not my works of righteousness, but what he has done has now got me covered. And that's how I get in. But heaven is a place also of activity, productivity, activity. Verse 20, chapter 22, verse 3, God's servants will serve him there. We're going to be, there's going to be stuff to do. There's going to be meaningful contribution made. Matthew 25, 23, you know this verse, you've heard it many times. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the little things, now enter in to your greater things. This is amazing to me, because what he's saying is that all the stuff that we consider to be so significantly important and that we pour our lives into, he says, those are just little things. Wait till you see what I've got for you on the other side. But when we're faithful in the little things, he says, there's more challenge, more inspiration, more things to do, more meaningful contribution that's coming on the other side. So we're not just going to sit around lazy, you know, the happiness of the Lord isn't just being lazy forever. He says, come, share your master's happiness. What is that? Well, making meaningful contributions. This is the satisfaction of co-laboring with God, of knowing that you're putting your shoulder, you're putting your mind, you're putting your heart into something that matters so much. And there's joy in the doing, satisfaction in the work. What kind of work? Well, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3 says that believers are actually going to be involved in management, judgment of angelic forces. I don't understand what that means. It's not really explained to us. But somehow the justice, the integrity, the character that is developed in our lives from the little things that we've been entrusted to here. He says, now I want you to take what you've learned here and I want you to apply it in management there. Jesus in Luke chapter 9 tells a story of somebody who was showing such faithfulness and such character in their service that now he says, now I'm going to put you in charge of five towns. I'm going to put you in charge of 10 cities. What does that mean? Well, we're not exactly sure, but it means authority. It means responsibility. It means meaningful contribution on the other side in this new city. You understand? So this life is a preparation for the main event of eternity. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21 says, those who are victorious, this is Jesus speaking, those who are victorious with me will sit with me on my, what? Are you kidding me? This is Jesus talking. What does he think about your forever? He thinks, I want you to learn and develop and overcome here because your overcoming is going to find application on the other side, on my throne. Sharing the throne of God? Yes, you've made in the image of God, remember? God has plans for you forever. You were meant not to just be here temporarily, but to learn here so that you could invest your life eternally with him to his glory. So this life is simply a preparation for the main event of heaven. The house lights are going down. The spotlight of eternity is coming on. Heaven is also, this city is a place of growth and learning. We're going to incur, encounter knowledge of things that we've never understood down here. And I'm talking about beyond physics, beyond quantum physics, beyond technology, beyond the nature of black holes and the mystery that, you know, that creates gravity and all that, beyond uh, the, the human genome and these amazing things that we're discovering about God's creation. But on the other side, there's even more. He says there's even more. Here, he says, we see through a glass dimly. It's like on our, bas uh, on our best day. The windshield is foggy. But he said, on that day, we're going to know, even as we are known. It's a deep, intimate understanding 
of what's real, of what's true. In life, I mean in heaven, life's great mysteries are going to be revealed. There's some old songs about this, you know, we'll understand it better by and by. But the mysteries of our, the disappointments, the tragedies, the seeming, God's seeming silence in the midst of some of the world's greatest sufferings. But in heaven's new city, part of the new learning, the knowledge is going to be, oh, oh, huh, wow, that was, we'll, we will know even as we are Known. Heaven's new city is a place of security, of productivity, and of growth and learning. And then heaven's garden. This massive garden teeming with life. And the tree of life. Oh my goodness, we're going to get to taste that tree. In the garden, right outside the city, the, uh, it's a place of immortality, the tree of life. It's the garden of heaven. The author of Hebrews says, you know, here we have no... Uh, continuing city. That simply means nothing lasts down here. Everything's on its way out. Everything's, you know, the world is passing away. So are we. I look in the mirror. I can tell it every day. <laughs> Where are you going, Bill? What did you do with my friend? You know, I used to know that person and now we're passing away. Every day obituaries remind us of this. People die. And right now, our prayers, our hearts, with our mission partners in the Middle East, this horrible tragedy of Turkey and Syria, too many lives too soon. It's a mystery. How do we understand this? And yet, death intrudes and interrupts. I worked with, uh, with Rick Stanley in Texas one summer when I was uh, younger in the ministry. Rick um, was known as Elvis Presley's stepbrother. And he said, you know, people ask me, how much did Elvis leave when he died? He said, I always tell them, all of it. Just like you. Whatever it is that you have amassed on this side, all of it is going to stay. You know, the Pharaohs thought they could take it with them, and then somebody else robbed their graves, and, you know, they, they didn't. We all leave it. Death mocks us. Nothing parades the embarrassing limitations of our humanity like mortality. And yet scripture says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, there's coming a day when that last enemy, death, is going to be destroyed. This mortal. I mean, think about this. Imagine this. You, this mortal, will put on immortality. It's not just the stuff of a computer-generated superhero movies. This perishable will put on imperishability. Listen to this one. This corruptible, oh man, wouldn't this be wonderful, will put on incorruptibility. I don't know, I haven't tried to do this, but I don't know that I can think back and remember a time when there wasn't some level of corruptibility being demonstrated in my adult life. I may want it not to be true, but this corruptible is one day going to get free of that. Death is going to lose its sting. And this garden is telling us a picture of where eternal life will be so alive that death doesn't have any place in me, in you. This is your inheritance in Christ. Now, legend tells us that Ponce de Leon, you know this, we got a boulevard named after him down here, that he came to our part of the new world in search of the fountain of youth, Right? And he had heard this legend of this fountain that could be found, and he thought it might be in South Florida. A lot of people still looking for it down here, right? <laughs> oh, they're stopping at the little nip and tuck shop to, to, take, to have a drink. Uh, but he said, you know, the fountain of youth, if you could just take a sip of this clear, refreshing ice, this water is so alive that it's going to reverse the aging process. Well, here's where that fountain's located. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. The angel showed me the river of life. Clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God. I am. He never gets old. Have a drink of him. You won't either. The lamb, the tree of life, is now bearing fresh fruit. The tree that our primeval parents were prohibited from ever touching because they'd already invited death 
into their life. And God was saying, you're not going to be eternally dead for me. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm coming after you. I'm going to bring you life. And then I'm going to bring you back into the garden where you can all have a taste. This is the heaven that is bearing fresh fruit every day. And someday every believer is going to have a drink out of that stream and a taste out of that tree. And you can have it every day for the rest of time. No more aches, no more pains, no more disease. No more depression. Brand new bodies, glorified like Christ's body. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that Jesus' resurrection body was the prototype, was the prototype. That means it's the first of its kind, but there's more to come. And you're in that line. You have one of those coming. The first of its kind, but our new heavenly bodies are going to be fashioned after His going to be like his. What does that mean? Well, I can tell you three things real quick. Number one, you're not going to be some kind of disembodied spirit floating around like a ghost looking for somebody to haunt or looking for somebody to fall in love with, like in Hollywood movies, you know, got ghosts falling in love with people left and right. That's not what scripture teaches. Number two, you're not going to be some um, reincarnated as somebody else. Just as your genetic code and your fingerprints are unique to you now, so you are uniquely you now, you will be who you are then as God's creation only redeemed and fully recreated in him. Your new body, you will be you on the other side. And then thirdly, you're not going to be dissolved into some kind of cosmic nirvana of nothingness where it's all done and over. No, no. Your body will be you and you will be fit for an eternal environment. Our resurrection bodies will exist beyond the power of deterioration and decay. Imagine, new in kind, never to grow old. Here we got to feed and house and clothe and medicate and exercise our bodies to resist decay, to try to stay fit, right? But there our bodies will be full of glory. Would you say glory? Glory. glory. Did you know theologians say this, that when you come to Christ and trust him in the forgiveness of your sins, justification has just taken place. That means you are free from the penalty of your sin by the gift of Christ's salvation and blood. And then as you let the Holy Spirit start working in you and transform you into his likeness, that's called sanctification. And that means you are being freed from the power of sin over you. And then they say, when we get to the final stage, it's called glorification. That's what we're talking about here. Your body, the reality that makes you, you inside your eternal skin is going to be glorified. You will be filled with doxa, the glory of God in you. You're created in his image so that you can be fully redeemed and experience his eternal glory, no longer subject to being dishonored by sin. I don't, I want that. I don't know how to understand it, but the fallen impulses of a rebellious fallen nature will no longer be dragging you down. They're all gone. They're all gone. No more moral failure. No more in word, in thought, in attitude, in deed, completely true and trustworthy, full of integrity in Christ. Our bodies will be glorified, raised in his likeness, in his power, beyond the limits of time, space, fatigue, and physique. You know, here we wear out, we burn out, we stress out, even doing the things we love but in heaven, every talent, every ability will be given full and unhindered expression because you will be full of the glory of God. Oh, come on, Lord, help us understand this. And then heaven's garden is a place of fulfillment. That's what we're talking about. Immortality and then fulfillment. 1 Corinthians 15, 48. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. Don't we know it? And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. What's that? That's what we're talking about. But listen to this. And just as we have borne the likeness of earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man 
from heaven. This is fantastic. But it's God's guarantee to every person who has trusted Christ and belongs to him. John, in his letter to the early believers, said it this way. What we will be has not yet been made known. (laughs) Man, this is like mind-blowing, imagination expanding. What's it going to be like? I don't know. But when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Jesus. Did Jesus have identity after the resurrection in his glorified body? Yes, so will you. In yours, did Jesus walk and talk and touch and be touched and hell? Yeah, and so will you. Did Jesus travel at the speed of thought? I mean, did he appear at will through a locked door and then disappear just as quickly? So will you. Going to be like him when you see him, like he is, you're going to be, he's going to be like you. Did he ascend to heaven, transcending every law of physics that we presently know on this side of that side? Yes, so will you. Jesus was not bound by material space. He could materialize at will. Did he eat? Did he drink? That matters, doesn't it? Yeah, he was right there uh, and his resurrected body on the sea at the beach eating fish that they had just cooked on that fire. Eating and drinking, yes. He promised we're going to eat and drink with him on the other side. You know this, right? That he said that it's going to be like heaven is going to be like this great banquet where the table's been set and it's going to be like a wedding feast like you have never seen ever. But you've got a place at the table there when you're in him. We're going to eat and drink and laugh and dance and play and party with God in Jesus Christ. And you know, now what we're talking about is being at home with God. Heaven is our new home. Our heavenly home is a place of joy, a place of identity, a place of love. God loves you. By the way, did you know God wants you to be his valentine? He loves you. He likes you. He made you. He knows you. He wants to be with you in this life and the next Love him back. We love him because he first loved us. This is coming home to God. How old are we going to be, Pastor? I don't know. Jesus was 33 when he got his resurrection body. We're going to be like him. 33 is okay with me. But we don't know. What we do know is this, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. No eye has seen. Would you read this one out loud with me? Let's everybody read this one together. Take a breath. No eye has seen. No ear heard, neither has it entered the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Oh my goodness, it's like Christmas morning and you walk downstairs from your room and you see this amazing table set and the tree is there and the father says, surprise, because you hadn't thought about it yet. The reason you get bored when you think about heaven is because you haven't had these thoughts yet. But the Father wants to surprise you on the other side that something made just for you. This is my wife's favorite verse, by the way, about a new life, a new city, a new garden, a new home with God, where we're sitting right down at the kitchen table and God is so close that he can just reach over and he can wipe the tear from your eye. That's the picture this is. You're you're having coffee with God. And he is so tenderly caring for you that he is wiping the tears from your eyes. There'll be no more death. No more crying. No more mourning. No more pain. No more curse. We don't know what that kind of world is like. We can't even really imagine it, can we? No more curse, no more evil, no more darkness. It's going to be like going home with all the lights on. It's a place prepared for you. There's your place right there at the table. Just, yeah, that's your place. And your room, it's right upstairs. That's your room. Yeah, you'll recognize the stuff in it, stuff you like. Trust me. You know, the Lord's saying, I know you. I made this place for you. Will there be streets of gold? 
Well, Revelation 21 says yes, 2121. Of course, people argue, is that symbolic? Is it real? I don't know. But here's the, what it means to me is, you know, the stuff that people live and die for down here, we're just going to pave the streets up there. It's like, get your head up and realize what's under your feet. Live higher. Revelation 21, 26 says, the glory and the honor of the nations will be there. Now, we don't know exactly all this means, and we don't know how, but it seems that all that which is good and pure and magnificent and honorable in human creativity, in human ingenuity, in the, the work of the image bearers that were entrusted with creation and with life, with art, music, culture, human culture, all of that is going to make it into the new house. You know, Lisa and I have been living in a cottage as our home is having some work done internally. And one of the things we did was take art with us into our cottage because it, we, it, we're attached to the beauty, to the stories, to the photographs, to the paintings. And so there in our cottage, we got our art. God is going to do the same thing. Say with somehow, I don't know how, but he's saying the honor of the nations will be there. This is heaven is not some earth denying nirvana. It is God's eternal yes to the goodness of his created image bearers and the splendor of earth's accomplishment in art, music, creativity, genius, all on display right there. I mean, I don't know if God has a great big refrigerator, but it's right there, you know, where everybody can see it, right there next to that Super Bowl 57 Chiefs championship that, that's, that's, that would be heaven. It would just be heaven. And those of you who want the eagles... Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I have a verse for you. So, Here's the most important question. Can you know you're going? And the scripture says yes. Jesus said yes. John chapter 1 verse 1, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, then he gave them the right. Listen to me. You want to talk about rights? This one matters. The right to become children of God. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he paid everything so that you might not perish but have eternal life. Gave his son, whoever believes in him, believe in his name. It's important. His name is important. Why? Speaks authority and it grants access. You know, when you approach heaven in Jesus' name, that has an authority that has power. It's like it's better than saying, open up in the name of the law. You know, you say, oh, I'm coming in Jesus' name. Oh, come right in. Relying on the one. Why does it have power? Because he is the one who in all of human history triumphed in his body over death and is now in his body, the resurrection body, now eternally alive, building the eternal city, the eternal, growing the eternal garden, and showing up for you in his eternal home, relying on the one who triumphed that we might share in his victory. Now, when Lisa and I were in Little Rock prior to coming here, uh, she worked at an office that hosted a youth day at the, uh, at the state's amusement park, Magic Springs. They rented the whole place out. And then since she, as a staff member, had done such good hard work through the year, she was given a VIP pass, which meant what? It meant authority that she had that granted free access to all the park's rides, every amusement, every concert, every show, and then this huge barbecue that was open. You know, free access for all of that for her and her guests. So that day, you know, it was like, yeah, we're with her. We're with her. We're, we're with her. See, we got access to all of that. Why? Because of Lisa's good hard work and because it was represented by her name. We're with her, Lisa. 
Listen, Scripture teaches that because of the finished perfect work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have now been invited in to freely experience all the qualities of an eternal heaven. But we don't get there based on our own authority, on our own work. We go in on somebody else's. My works are soiled. My spirit is corrupted. My spirit is spoiled, dead in sin. And heaven, the sign outside says, no sin allowed. And what, how am I going to solve that problem? If nothing impure is allowed inside, chapter 22, Revelation, Jesus says this, blessed are those who wash. You wash your robes so that you might have the right to the tree of life and just come right on through the gates into the city. Why do you want to get inside the city? Because outside is where the dogs are, the scavengers, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who practices falsehood. All the liars are outside. This, like, this world plagued by promiscuity, by sin, by infidelity, by violence, by deception, by lies, but not heaven, not allowed in, Revelation 21, 27. Listen, this is Jesus speaking. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Here's a question. How do you get your name in that book? Is your name in that book? The Lamb's keeping a book? It's got names in it? You gotta have my, you're just gonna check the book when I stand outside the gate and say, can I get in? Well, let's check the book. Your name in the book? How do you get your name in the book? Do you know? That's like important, isn't it? We get our names in the Lamb's book of life by his grace. You gotta choose it though, it's not automatic. There's not a default setting that says, oh yeah, everybody, come on in. No, because no sin is allowed, no, nothing impure is allowed. What do I do if I got impurities in me? Here's what scripture says, the spirit and the bride say, come. That means you gotta make a choice. Whoever's thirsty, there's your prerequisite. You thirsty? Then come. Whoever wishes, let him take from the tree the free gift of the water of life, that living water that only Jesus can give. And he says, do you want it? Then come. And then we're told how in the last verse of the Bible. This is the very last verse of the whole Bible. And it tells us how. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. You gotta to choose to receive the grace of God. How do you do that? You stop trying to run your own life. You stop trying to be your own God. You turn from going your own way as if you are in charge of everything and you turn, that's what repent is. It just means just turn around and then you go and toward God. Let God be God and you're walking toward him with him by his grace, by faith. You turn from your sin to walk with him and allow his death on the cross to wash you clean on the inside. And then his spirit, when he rose from the dead and gave his spirit, now his spirit can come and live inside of you. So that now the scripture says, he who has the son has life. And the one who does not have the son doesn't have life. Do you have the son? Well, have you asked him to come into your life? Have you turned from your sin? I didn't, that doesn't mean clean your act up and try to do better. It means you just turn from running it your way and turn to let him meet you so that he can guide you in his way. And then you say, your kingdom come. You're the king in my life. And now your will be done in me. Have you welcomed his blood to wash your sins away? Have you welcomed his spirit to come and live inside of your life, then do it today if you haven't. Now, if you, and if you haven't, here's how you can do it. Jesus, forgive my sin, come into my life, help me turn fully away from my ego self-ism and toward you and I believe in you. You're the son of God, I receive you as my savior and now I'm asking you to lead me in the doing of your will. Now, some, many of you are already saying, oh, I already prayed that prayer. Okay, did you know that you don't have to go to heaven by yourself? Here's another prayer for you. Anybody you'd like to be there when you get there? 
Any family member, any friend, any business associate, any neighbor, anybody that maybe you could say, okay, wait, maybe taking them to heaven's a little bit much. Maybe you could just invite them to church. That's a step in the right direction. Do we go immediately to heaven when we die? Well, what did Jesus say to the thief that died with him? Today, you're with me in paradise. They died together, and Jesus enters paradise with a new friend on his arm. (laughs) No thieves allowed in heaven. No, he was a different man by the time he got there. His sins were covered. His life was spirit-filled, and now he's being welcomed into the heaven that Jesus wanted him to have. Will you be there? If not, settle it today. And believer, if you're going, maybe there's somebody that God would like to remind you of, that this would be a good day to pray for them. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this amazing vision. We pray you would capture our imagination. Holy Spirit, enlarge our understanding open our eyes, soften our hearts, help us to see as you see that we might then live on higher ground. If there's somebody, brother, sister, that you want to pray for, then may I add my amen to your prayer right now? A loved one, a wayward child, a hardened boss, Who is it, a friend, that somehow heaven just wouldn't quite be heaven if they weren't there? Then we pray together for them. We remember those that are suffering and grieved in Turkey, in Syria, in Ukraine, in so many parts of the world right now, in your world right now, too. We ask that God be a comforter and a counselor to you. But friend, maybe you've joined us today and you just know that God wants you to be his valentine, that he would want you to know you are personally significant to him and that he is personally fond of you and that the cross represents love that he wants to bring into your life. You can pray with me right now, as I already mentioned earlier, Jesus, if you love me like that, come into my life, forgive my sins. Fill me with your spirit. I receive you as my savior. I believe you are the son of God. And by faith in your grace, I am receiving your promise right now that whoever has the son has life. Come into my life. Our heads bowed just for a moment longer, but if you prayed that prayer with me and would let me ask God's blessing upon your next steps of faith, then would you simply raise your hand and keep it up for a moment so that I can look across the room and there online, please join the chat if you just prayed with me there. God bless you. In the back center, right here in the front center, God bless you. Amen. Lord Jesus, for every person who by uplifted hand said their heart is open to you, we pray that they would sense your spirit's presence lifting them and assuring them today. And we thank you that you have promised that to all who believe, who receive, you give them the right to be a child of God forever. Amen.